Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see all of you uh, this morning. And from a little bit of a different angle than you'd normally see me from, right? I must say, I'm feeling a little bit odd standing here without a guitar this morning. If I thought about it, I probably would have just sang my whole sermon or had a guitar just hanging here the whole time for familiarity. But I didn't think of it, luckily for you, so don't worry. Have you ever wondered why so many songs in the church, in the, in the church, in the charts, very different, are all about heartbreak? Let's take Adele, for instance. You know, she's written some classic heartbreak songs, right? I was reading an article this week titled, No Joke, an Adele song for every stage of your breakup, from anger to moving on. <laughs> but it's not just Adele, right? So many of the best-selling pop songs of all time have been about heartbreak. Let's think about it for a second. There's Believe by Cher. That amazing song, I love it, I Will Always Love You. Or my personal all-time favorite, I Will Survive, I Will Survive. <laughs> Did you know that all of these songs have sold over 10 million copies? It's crazy. Why do we enjoy listening to songs about people going through a tough time? <laughs> Sounds awful when you say it like that, right? But my best guess would be that it's because we can relate to them. We all know what it means to be heartbroken, to be in pain, to suffer. And that's what I want to speak about this morning, this really tough topic of suffering. Now, hearing me say that, you may be wondering, who is this girl who looks about 16 years old trying to talk to me about suffering. Now, if you are thinking that, sadly, I'm going to have to admit that I'm actually not 16. But I'm hoping that this whole looking younger than I am thing is going to pay off later in life. But the truth is, regardless of age or actually anything else, whether it's wealth, status or occupation, we can all relate to this. At some point in our lives, we will all go through tough times. In our passage today, we read of two sisters who are going through a time like that. I'm going to read for us from John 11, starting at verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now, in the next few verses, Jesus and his disciples have a little bit of a back and forth where the disciples think that Lazarus is just sleeping and not dead. Awkward. And then Jesus just kind of spells it out plainly in verse 14. He says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus and Martha go on to have a conversation where Jesus tells her that Lazarus is going to rise from the dead. And then Martha goes to get her sister, Mary. Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. 
verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's already been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. If there's someone who likes to plan, it is me. I'm not just talking about the one-year kind of plan. I'm talking about the five-year, ten-year kind of plan. Like Mars was saying, I have lots of questions. And before I came to Malaysia, I was in London doing a training year for worship leaders called the Worship Central Academy. We run intensive versions of it here about twice a year. And as I came to the end of my course, I started to think about what was next. And after a few conversations, it looked like I had a full-time job ready for me when I finished my course. You know, I had it made. My friends were stressing out about what jobs they were going to go into. And I had it all sorted. Or at least I thought. Imagine how I felt the day when I got a call that said that that full-time job was no longer an option. What? I didn't know what I was going to do. I hadn't been actively looking at other jobs because I thought I had this one. So I cried, I panicked, and I cried again and just did this on repeat for a while, like an episode out of Bridget Jones. And then I finally calmed down. And when I did, I was left with three questions and a whole load more. Why, how, and what was I going to do? Have you ever had a moment like that where you found yourself in the midst of pain, crying out to God? In our passage today, we read of two sisters who cry out to Jesus in the midst of their grief following the death of their brother. These were some of Jesus' closest friends. And the knowledge that Jesus wasn't there for them tears them apart. But I believe that even in the midst of this pain, we find five truths that we can hold on to in tough times. So you guys ready? Truth number one. God loves you. God loves you. Now, however familiar or not so familiar, this simple but powerful truth may be to you. When we can find ourselves in a tough time, it can be the first thing to fly out the window when it's the one thing that we really need to hold on to. And we read right here at the start of the passage in verse 3 that Lazarus is the one that Jesus loves. Jesus loves Lazarus. And what's more, verse 5 says this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus so... Now this word so is really important because what it says is that Jesus loved Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And so everything he does after this is from that place of love for them, not from any other motivation. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? That doesn't make any sense at all. Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he stays where he was two more days. Shouldn't that say, but, not so? <laughs> Let's not forget that these were some of Jesus' closest friends. 
If I found out that one of my closest friends was in hospital about to die, I wouldn't be sitting there finishing my episode of Netflix and my box of popcorn. I would be there as quick as I possibly could. Though, you know, with the KL Jaminal, it probably would be two days. But let's skip to verse 17, where we read that by the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. So what that tells us is when Jesus found out Lazarus was sick, he was actually two days traveling distance from where Lazarus was, which probably means that whether he'd left straight away or when he did, Lazarus still probably would have died. But you know what? To me, and we see to Mary and Martha in the story also, that doesn't justify him waiting two days to leave. He could have at least tried And yet we read that he deliberately waits because he loves them. Have you ever had a moment where God has done something which seems incompatible with his love for you? When that job fell through, I couldn't understand how if God loves me, he'd allowed that to happen. So how do we handle it when we're in that situation, when we want to hold on to the truth that God loves us, but when our situations tell us something different? Well, that's when we can come to truth number two. Truth number two is that you can be honest with God. When we don't understand what God is doing, we need to pray. And it's okay and good for us to be honest in our prayers. God can take it. A perfect example of this is in the Psalms, which are often raw outpourings of emotion that at times are so raw and honest that they can even be hard to read. But we also see it right here in the passage where both Mary and Martha are honest with Jesus about their struggle of him waiting two days to leave when he heard that Lazarus was sick. Verse 21 says, Lord, this is Martha speaking, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Wow. Talk about honesty. (laughs) She just goes straight to the point and hits the nail on the head of her sadness and her disappointment. Now, being British, I would have needed to have said that much more politely, cushion that statement a whole lot more. You know, something like, uh, dear Lord Jesus, I was wondering if I maybe possibly could air my ever so slight difficulty, no, uh, disappointment, with your somewhat prolonged travel plans to meet us. But no, Martha goes straight to the point. She loves Jesus and she knows that Jesus loves her. So because the relationship is there, she knows that she can be honest with him. So what does Mary do when she joins the conversation? Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When we see something like this repeated word for word in the Bible, it normally means that it's important. And here its repetition seems to not only highlight the depth of the sister's pain, but also their decision to be honest with Jesus about it. Mary and Martha are permission givers for us to be honest with God when we're not okay. It's okay not to be okay. Who loves a good rom-com here? A good romantic comedy? Mars, are you putting your hand up there? Good. I'm not alone. I love them. Give me a good rom-com and some chocolate and I'm sorted any night of the week. But what I have realized is that rom-coms don't tell tell you so much about the reality of relationships. Like they talk a lot about the happily ever after, but not so much about the hard work you have to put in to make them work. Now for the last two years, I've been dating a great guy called Aaron, the handsome guy on the front row down here. And I remember one time, (laughs) it's like, yeah, that's it. I remember one time, 
Erin and I had fallen out about something, which was shocking, I know. I thought I was so easy to get along with until I started a relationship. But anyway, basically, I just gave him the silent treatment. I knew that eventually we'd get round to talking. And by that time, you know, I'd have myself sorted, my thoughts together, and I could communicate in the best version of me. Now, don't worry, we did eventually get round to talking. We're all good. And when we did, he said this, Hannah, you've got to keep talking to me, even when you're annoyed at me, because that makes me feel loved. Wow. That conversation floored me because I'd never considered that me taking the time to be real and honest with him, even when I was annoyed, could make him feel loved. I thought that would be by me sorting out my thoughts and then communicating in the best version of me. I often fall into this with God too. But the truth is, God doesn't want the Instagram version of ourselves. He wants the real version. And that's because he loves us. And us being real with him about how we are feeling can be our act of love to him. So if that's the case, what might being honest with God look like? Well, it might be praying, even when we don't feel like praying. And when we don't, it's okay for us to ask God to give us a desire to pray. That is a prayer too. Or it might be singing out in worship here on a Sunday, even when we don't feel like worshiping, bringing all the pain before God. So start where you are, don't shut God out, and know that you can be honest with him. Now, the good news is we don't need to do this alone, and that's because of truth number three. Jesus weeps with you. In verse 33, it reads, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Then we read the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus experienced every human emotion we could ever experience, whether it's betrayal, grief, anger, but he also experienced joy, love, and compassion. Jesus is deeply compassionate. And though there will be many sufferings in this life that we may never understand, what we can know in each and every situation is Jesus is with us. Jesus weeps with us. And that's because he loves us. This knowledge that Jesus weeps with us should change how we respond to those around us going through a tough time too. Recently, a member of this church and also SPTC, our theological college, caught dengue, and he's given me permission to share his story. Basically, he got really, really sick, and every day we got an update saying that his platelet count had dropped yet again, until the point where it went as low as four. Now, I'm told that the average should be in excess of 300, so basically four was really, really bad. But what I saw through the whole of this time was so many people from this church, so many of you, and also SBTC, coming around him and his family, going to the hospital to meet him, sending him messages of encouragement, and praying for him, whether from home or in hospital. It was so encouraging to me, and I know that it meant so much to that family to know that they weren't going through it alone. I'm so happy to say that today he's been completely healed. Today you might be here and going through a tough time and you might feel alone or isolated. And if you are, I'd really recommend a connect group. That could be the perfect place for you. So Jesus weeps with us. And just as he weeps with us, we too can weep with those around us who are going through a tough time. 
That might be by literally crying with them. If you're like me, I am just a total crier. Or it might be by showing empathy in some way. Our instinct, or certainly mine, when people go through a tough time around me, can be to want to help them out of it, to come up with solutions. But I've learned that sometimes all they really need is a hug to say that they're not going through it alone. A hug can speak a thousand words. Truth number four. God has good plans for you. As I've said, we'll never be able to make sense of every suffering that there is in the world because we live in a fallen world. And what I don't want to do this morning is to talk about the different theories that there are about why suffering exists. But if you do want to explore that, I'd really recommend a book by Nikki Gumbel, pioneer of the Alpha Course, called Why Does God Allow Suffering? But whilst there are many sufferings that we can't make sense of, That shouldn't stop us trusting, even though it's so hard, that God still has good plans for us. That he can bring good even out of the worst situations. Remember that job opportunity I told you about earlier. When that fell through, I applied for another one, and I didn't get that either. I remember it was such a painful time and I was honest with God. I said to him, am I not good enough? Is this not the field you want me to go into? Has my whole training just been a waste of time? It was so tough. But I made a conscious decision in that moment to trust that God had something better for me, even though I couldn't see it at the time. You see, regardless of what your circumstances tell you, God has good plans for you because he loves you. Little did I know that all of those closed doors and disappointments would lead me here to Malaysia. I mean, can you imagine what my life would have looked like without banana leaf rice? I, I, re- I really can't. Let's imagine the faith that the people must have had when Jesus asked them in verse 39 to roll the stone away. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. That tomb must have really stank. My friend the other day showed me a video of people opening cans of the smelliest fish in the world. Fun fact, it's from Sweden. And basically, it smells so bad that even when they open it, like the tiniest bit, the smell is so bad that they projectile vomit. It is absolutely gross. Do not watch the video. But I would imagine that Lazarus's body, after four days of being in that tomb, smelled a little bit like that smelly fish. But yet they do it. They roll away the stone, trusting, as it says in verse 40, that if they believe, they will see the glory of God. They trust that Jesus has good plans for them and isn't just wanting to see them projectile vomit, like in that video. They knew Jesus. They'd heard of the miracles he had been performing. And so they roll away the stone in expectation of the turning point, in expectation of the miracle, in expectation of his good plans. What the people couldn't do was raise Lazarus from the dead. Only Jesus could do that. But what they could do was to roll the stone away so that God could reveal his glory. What could rolling away the stone look like as we journey with those around us going through a tough time? Even when our situations tell us that he doesn't, when it looks like the darkness and the hopelessness of the tomb, We can hold on to this truth that God has good plans for us, plans to bring us hope and a future. But when it does feel like we are in the darkness of that tomb, we can hold on to this fifth and final truth. Suffering is not the end of the story. 
Not only do the people get to roll the stone away so that Jesus could perform the miracle, they then get to witness Lazarus being raised from the dead. This is amazing. Lazarus was raised from the dead. And then they get to celebrate with him as they unwrap his grave clothes and watch him walk away. Jesus knew that this moment was coming all along. In verse 4, he declared, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. You know what still bugs me though? Even if Jesus knew that Lazarus was going to die, regardless of when he left, or even if he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, why couldn't he just stop Mary and Martha from going through so much pain? I mean, this is Jesus. Couldn't he have just teleported or something and stopped Lazarus from dying? And yet it says that he was glorified in it. Why does it say at the beginning that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he waited two days? Well, in verse 14, Jesus tells his disciples that Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. The so points to so many other so's. Jesus waited so that Lazarus would be in the tomb for four days, so that he could raise him from the dead, so everyone could see his resurrection power. By Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead after a whole four days of him being in the tomb, how much more could people believe when Jesus died the ultimate death on the cross? that he could rise from the dead after just three days. Little did Mary and Martha know when they were in that, ta- that state of grief following the death of their brother, that Jesus was not only going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but that his resurrection was going to point towards the resurrection of resurrections that would change everything forever. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, just as suffering was not the end for Mary or Martha or Lazarus, we know that it won't be the end for us either. But you know what? I get that Mary and Martha saw the end of their suffering quite soon, after just four days. And some of you in this room may have been having to deal with situations like this for not just four days, but maybe 40 days, four years, 40 years. And it's in those situations that we can gain an eternal mindset and know that there will be a time where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain because of what Jesus has done on the cross. This is our hope of an eternal life without suffering because Jesus died and rose again. And by the Holy Spirit who lives in us from the moment that we ask Jesus into our lives. This same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us too today. So shall we ask to receive more of that power this morning? Shall we stand? We're going to pray together. Why don't we just hold our hands out? I like to do that um, just as a kind of a posture of being open to God. Come, Holy Spirit. 